All right, so we're moving into the chapter on power cycles, vapor power cycles. Uh, this is the way electricity is made, predominant way electricity is made in the United States. You have vapor, steam, water going through different components. One of the components is a steam turbine that has an output shaft that is fed to an electric generator, and that makes the electricity. The lights in this room, about 40% is generated by coal-fired power plant in San Antonio. About 33% generated by nuclear power plant. Both of those operate on a vapor power cycle. Steam, boiling, and condensing. All right. So we'll review the Carnot vapor power cycle as the benchmark, the gold standard, and then we'll compare it to a practical or an ideal Rankine vapor power cycle. And then we'll start without any superheating, and then we'll move into thinking about how, what is the thermal efficiency of the cycle, back work ratio, those key metrics, how to improve the performance. Uh, you make it, everything as reversible as possible. Irreversibilities degrade the performance. But if you increase the boiler pressure, that's good for performance. If you decrease the condenser pressure, that's good for performance. Uh, superheating and then having multiple stages to your turbine and going back for reheat between the high pressure stage and the low pressure stage of a turbine is good for performance. So this is the way coal-fired power plants work, nuclear power plants work. We don't have any solar concentrating solar power plants, but they're still out there. They've been kicked around for the last 30 or 40 years and ideas. Um, there's a few that are in operation, but they're really for demonstration purposes. But it uses a vapor power cycle as well. And geothermal often is a vapor power cycle. Geothermal, okay? There's a lot of material in this chapter we're skipping, so just know that. What happens when you go to the second class, Thermo 2? Straight through chapter 8, plowing a lot deeper, covering more topics. So the Carnot vapor power cycle is named after the Saadi Carnot, who we've inter been introduced before, a French physicist engineer. These are the years that he lived. Uh, and in 1824, he wrote Reflections on the Motive Power of Fire. Also, we're going to study the ideal Rankine cycle. This is William John Maruquin Rankine and University, Glasgow University up in Scotland, an engineer and physicist. These are the years he lived. And in 1859, he produced a manual on the steam engine and prime movers. And yes, he did so much work, both in thermodynamics as well as other areas of engineering, that there's a lot of things named after him or uh, he's honored by his contributions by like the temperature scale, the Rankin temperature scale is one, et cetera. So what about the Carnot vapor power cycle? It's made of four components. One is a boiler. Steam comes out of the boiler and goes to a turbine, and then out of the turbine, it goes to a condenser, then out of the condenser, it goes to a pump, and out of the pump, back to the boiler. So that's the cycle, that's the loop. Four major components, boiler or steam generator, a turbine, a condenser, and a pump. We'll introduce states. We'll talk about the state of the steam one that leaves the boiler and enters the turbine. State two is what leaves the turbine and enters the condenser. And state three is the state of the steam leaving the condenser and entering the pump. And state four is back again. Now, for the Carnot cycle, it's assumed that state one is saturated vapor and that state four is saturated liquid. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the uh, pressure and the temperature everywhere in this cycle. To help us, we'll introduce or the temperature entropy diagram. This helps us understand. That. So temperature entropy diagram. Well, we put the dome on the temperature entropy diagram and then we introduce two lines of constant pressure. A line of constant pressure at a high pressure, so that's P high, 
and a low pressure, that's P low. All right. One of the keys of a Carnot heat engine is all the heat is brought in at the high temperature and all of the heat is rejected from the working fluid at the low temperature. And so we see that this temperature right here is the high temperature and this temperature right there is the low temperature. That's within or under that dome. All right. Where is state one then? State one is saturated vapor at that high pressure. It's at TH, isn't it? But then we go through a turbine. It's going to be reversible expansion through the steam turbine, negligible changes in kinetic and potential energy. Where is state two compared to state one? Straight down, straight down, straight down, constant entropy. It's isentropic expansion through that steam turbine. Uh, talk about state two. Is it a two-phase mixture? Yeah, it's a two-phase mixture with the fairly high quality, maybe 80, 90 percent quality, some number high quality. Now, where is state four? We said it was saturated liquid at that high pressure. There is state four right there. If we're going to have a reversible pump, just like we had a reversible turbine, state three and state four would have the same entropy, wouldn't they? So where is state three? When I think to myself, the Carnot vapor power cycle, I work backwards to go from four back to three. I just drop straight down, and that's state three. So the cycle looks like this on a TS diagram. It's tucked within the dome, and it looks like a box or a rectangle. All of the heat is rejected at the low temperature, and all of the heat is brought into the cycle and the working fluid at the high temperature. Okay, so talk a little bit about the turbine. What comes into the turbine is a high pressure. What goes out of the turbine is low pressure. Isn't there a change in pressure across the turbine? So P1 is high and P2 is low pressure. Likewise, the pump. There's a low pressure into the pump and there's a high pressure out of the pump. So really there's only two pressures for the whole system, the high pressure and the low pressure. The boiler is constant pressure. The pressure at one is the same as the pressure at four. The boiler changes the phase of the fluid, but it doesn't change the pressure of the fluid. So P1 is P4. They're both high pressure. Likewise, P2 is equal to P3. The condenser condenses some of that steam, but it doesn't change the pressure. The only devices that change pressure are the turbine and the pump. Well, when we analyze this system, we're interested in making a property, a, a table of states. So state one, two, three, and four. And we'd be interested in putting the pressure maybe in kilopascal, the temperature in degree C, maybe the quality, dimensionless, the enthalpy in kilojoules per kilogram, the entropy in kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. And if you wanted, you could put the specific volume. I'd put it out of order, but often we don't even need the specific volume. But if you needed it, meters cubed per kilogram there. And you say to yourself, what helps us determine state one? What fixes state one? I like to put a little column right there. Remind myself, what fixes state one? In words, I know state one is saturated vapor at the high pressure. So I know it's, oh, it's saturated vapor at high pressure. So it's like the pressure is a given. It's given to me in the problem statement and it's saturated vapor. So I could go and I could look up T. How would I get the temperature at state one? It's T sat at pH. What about the quality at state one? It's 100%, it's saturated vapor. 
What about the enthalpy at state 1? H of G, enthalpy of saturated vapor. How about the entropy? S, G, and B sub G if I needed it. True? Think about the logic now for state 2. We already talked about it. We know the pressure at 2, and we know the entropy at 2. We, we deduce that it's isentropic expansion through that turbine. So it's like I know pressure and the entropy. What is the entropy at state 2? S1. It's like it comes down right there. I know the entropy. So if I know the pressure and the entropy, could I get the temperature? Sure. And actually it's that saturation temperature because the quality is in that region, that two-phase region. The quality at state 2 would be calculated. And the enthalpy at state 2, just like the entropy at state 2. If you needed, you could get V sub 2, but no, really no application for that. Then jump to state 4 before you go to state 3. If you jump to state 4, what is its saturated liquid, isn't it? And it's at that low pressure. So it's like I know this is at the, I'm sorry, this is the high pressure. This is the high pressure. It's at the high pressure. This was the low pressure at 2, and 3 is at the low pressure. Okay. So if I know the pressure in a saturated liquid at state 4, I could get the temperature at 4. That's equal to the temperature also at 1, isn't it? Don't they have the same temperature, 1 and 4? How about the quality? 0, saturated liquid. How about the enthalpy? H of F and S of F, right? So those are the properties at state 4. Now go back to state 3 because uh, it's going through that special pump that's reversible, it's adiabatic, hence it's isentropic. So the entropy at state the entropy at state 3 is equal to the entropy at state 4. So we know the pressure and the entropy to help fix state 3 so I can get the temperature at 3. That's T sat at the low pressure. Is there the same? Just like these are the same temperature. That it's some unknown quality, but the quality at state 3 is lower than at state 2. And we get the enthalpy at state 3. So we get our the, all of our states. We we determine all of these enthalpies and entropies, organize it in a table. I'm handing back the exam today. Uh, those who actually organize some of the sol solution to the problems on the exam by using a table, I think, as, as a group, did better. If they organize the results in a table, they actually seem to do better and score higher. All right, let me scoot this up just a little bit. All right. Now, what are we interested in calculating? We're interested in calculating the work produced by the turbine. What's that? Well, draw it like this, the work produced by the turbine. And when you do a first law analysis for a control volume around that turbine, you get it in terms of a change in enthalpy. Wouldn't it be H1 minus H2? That's the work out of the turbine. What about the next device, Q condenser? Here, I'm going to talk about Q out of the condenser because we know that the steam is being partially condensed in the condenser. There's heat transfer out of the steam to some other working fluid, let's say lake water or air or something. So what is the heat transfer out of the steam per unit mass going through the condenser? Well, it's H2 minus H3. Analyze the pump. What's the work going into the pump? Because we know it's a work consuming device, so we'll say a positive WP into the pump. That's equal to H4 minus H3. And Q into the fluid in the boiler. Q boiler. That will be 
H1 minus H4. So we, we talk about all positive Q's and positive W's because we know the direction of those energy transfers, be they work or heat transfers. Well, we're interested in calculating the work net out of the cycle. Maybe I even put out here, work net out of the cycle. Well, the, the pump, well, the turbine produces work, but the pump consumes some work, doesn't it? So the net work out is WT minus WP. Make sense? And then what about Q net into the cycle? Well, we have Q boiler in minus Q condenser out. So I take care of that negative <laughs> sign by putting a negative Q condenser in that, that uh, the balance for the Q net. What is the relationship between work net out and the Q net in. They need to be the same. They need to be equal. If they're not equal, what do you know about your analysis? It's wrong. Look for an error. If they're not equal, somehow conservation of energy is not, energy is not being conserved. You, you violated somewhere the first law of thermodynamics in the calculations. So always check that. Now there's three very important metrics, three important metrics for the cycle. They may seem pretty basic, but one is W net. Why is that an important metric? Well, it tells me the net work out of the cycle per kilogram that I'm sending in the loop. It's how many kilojoules of work out per kilogram going in the loop as an engineer. Would you want this to be high or low? Would you like a large kilojoule out for every kilogram that goes in the loop? Or would you like a low kilojoule out for every kilogram? What do you like? You want this high. You want that to be high. All right, second is the thermal efficiency of the cycle. Ooh, what is the thermal efficiency of the cycle? It'll be the net work out divided by Q net in or Q boiler. Is Q boiler equal to Q net in? No. And a lot of times students will say, oh, the thermal efficiency is Q net, W net divided by Q net, they'll get 100%. That just confirmed that you didn't make an error in the first law is true. You know what I mean? It's W net is equal to Q net. So you don't divide by Q net, you divide by only the amount of heat that was brought into the cycle in the boiler because you had to throw some away to the environment through the condenser. That's just waste heat. Okay, so this is the correct thermal efficiency. Let me ask you as a performance engineer, do you want a high thermal efficiency for your power plant or low? Which one do you like? You like a high thermal efficiency. I didn't leave enough room, but the third metric is called the back work ratio. Back work ratio. Your turbine is producing some power out, but somewhere in the cycle you need to consume some power back into the cycle. Where do you need to consume it back in? In the pump. And so they say, what percent of what the turbine produced do I need to feed back to the pump? That's the back work ratio. So it's the, the work that the pump required divided by the work that the turbine produced. And so the back work ratio, pause for a minute, Think about this, you're a design engineer. Do I want a high back work ratio? A large fraction of the energy that the turbine produced go back to drive the pump, is that good? Or would I like a low back work ratio? You would like a low back work ratio, that's what's good. So even though you have three metrics, two of them you'd like to see them high. One of them you'd like to see it low. All right. Now, I tried to put this on half of the screen. I didn't quite fit. <laughs> but now let's talk about the ideal Rankine cycle. 
Well, you still have a boiler. You still have it going out to a turbine. You still have a condenser. And you still have a pump. So the four major components are the same. They're the same. They're the same. You could put state one out of the boiler into the turbine. State two out of the turbine into the condenser. State three out of the condenser into the pump and state four out of the pump into the boiler. All of those states are the same. And we'll even leave state one to be saturated vapor. We're not going to superheat it yet. That's the next lecture. Just bring it out, saturated vapor. But from a practical point of view, there are not too many pumps that like two-phase mixtures. What does a pump like to take in? liquid. So should the condenser stop condensing and then feed the pump a two-phase mixture or should the water going into the condenser what comes out of it is completely condensed and it's saturated liquid. That's what we want. And so state three is changed to be saturated liquid. Stop and pause for a minute. Where was saturated liquid for the Carnot? At state four. Did four have the same pressure as three? No. So the change is so that you can have saturated liquid going into the pump. Let me ask another question. Can you describe state four? <coughs> compressed liquid or subcooled liquid? It's compressed liquid. So let me put this on a temperature entropy diagram, temperature entropy diagram. Here it is. Here is my high pressure. Here is my low pressure. Here is state one. Here is state two. There is state three and there is state four. So three and four are close together. Four is in the subcooled liquid region and three is saturated liquid. Compare the, the uh, work net is going to be good. It's going to be good for the, uh, the uh, Rankin, ideal Rankin cycle. The thermal efficiency of the ideal Rankin will be lower than the thermal efficiency of the Carnot. We'll talk about that more later. And the back work ratio of the ideal Rankin will be a lot lower than the the back work ratio of the Carnot. So this is great. This is good. Lower back work ratio is good. This is not so good. Bad. All right. That we didn't, we, we, our thermal efficiency is down. But the net work out of the cycle is going to be good for the Carnot. This, this is going to be better than the work net for the Carnot. All right. I'm going to go ahead and stop right there.